a great pleasure to welcome Benjamin Schlein here from the University of Zurich. And he's going to talk about correlation energy of weekly interacting Fermi gases. Just to remind everyone, this um, talk is being recorded and the recording is going to be available on our YouTube channel. So please, Benjamin, the floor is yours. Okay, so, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you um, over Zoom. Uh, um, so today I would like to say something about uh, some recent result that I uh, obtained together with uh, um, Nils Benedicter, with Nam, with Marcello, and with uh, uh, Robert Saringer concerning the correlation energy of a gas of uh, weakly interacting uh, fermions. So let me uh, start by explaining the model that we are looking at. We are considering a uh, mm, kind of a mean field limit. So let me try to mm, explain what this means. We are considering system with n fermions. At the end, of course, n is going to tend to infinity. So you should think of n as being a large number. And these fermions are uh, moving in a fixed box. Uh, we take here the box uh, from zero to two pi uh, in three dimension. And uh, uh, we impose periodic boundary conditions. So you can think of it as being a torus, uh, uh, in fact. OK, uh, we have this n particle. And these n particles interact. And they interact through a, a potential. We assume the potential to be of positive type, meaning that the Fourier transform of the potential has a positive uh, coefficients. And we assume the potential to vary on the same length scale characterizing the box. So length scale of order one in this set. OK, so you should uh, think if I can draw something here. We have our box like that. We have these uh, particles, right? And there is the interaction with uh, um, um, interaction potential, which varies on scales of order one. So it has something of this form here. So this means that we are in a situation where each particles interact with all other particles, right? And this is why we call it a mean field uh, regime. And which means that uh, if you look at typical states, the sum of uh, uh, n squared uh, uh, factors of v of x i minus x j is going to be a quantity of order n squared, right? Now let's, let's compare this potential energy with the kinetic energy of these n particles. And we are in a box with fixed volume. So because of the Pauli principle, so remember we are looking at fermions, which means that we are restricting our attention to wave functions that are anti-symmetric with respect to any permutation of the n particles, which means that the, the, the kinetic energy is larger than it would be for, uh, for, for bosons, right? And, and uh, in this case, since we are in three dimension, the potential energy is typically of the order n to the five third. It cannot be smaller than n to the five third. Good. So you see that if you want to have a regime where uh, uh, both kinetic and potential energy are comparable and they are both of order n, we should rescale the potential energy with a factor one over n, right? Because n squared over n is going to scale proportionally to n, so extensively. And we have to rescale the kinetic energy by this factor, which I, I write it as epsilon squared, but epsilon is not, it's just a short annotation for n to the minus one third. It means I'm multiplying the sum of the Laplacian with a factor n to the minus two third to make sure when you compare with this guy here, that also the kinetic energy of the system is of the order n, right? So both kinetic and potential energy with the scaling are extensive quantities proportional to n. I like to write these uh, factors n to the minus two third as epsilon squared, because I want to think of it uh, as a semi-classical parameter of this epsilon. You should think of it as a, a Planck constant, which means that in, we are considering a mean field uh, limit, which is naturally coupled with a semi-classical limit uh, for these fermions, where Planck's constant scales as n to the minus one third. And remember that n in the limit is going to go to infinity. Very well. Uh, so this is the Hamilton operator that we are looking at. And in particular, we're going to be interested in the ground state energy. So in the lowest eigenvalue of this uh, Hamilton operator, which can be characterized by taking the infimum of expectation of Hn over all n particle states psi. And again, because of the fermionic, system, the fermionic statistics, I'm restricting my attention here to psi, which are 
anti-symmetric with respect to permutation of the n particles. Good. So let's uh, uh, move on if there are no questions. Of course, if there are any questions, please uh, uh, interrupt me. I am I'm happy to explain more. Uh, um, so, so among all possible fermionic states, the simplest states that you can think of having this uh, anti-symmetry with respect to permutations are so-called Slater determinants, which you can build up by considering a family, an orthonormal family of one particle wave function, which I call here F1, F2, up to Fn. Okay, so these are elements of a one particle state L2 of lambda. They are orthonormal, they are orthogonal, and they're normalized. And using this F1 to Fn, you can, of course, construct the determinant. And by construction, the determinant, of course, has the correct symmetry. So it changes the sign if you exchange two particles, for example. Good. Now, later determinants are uh, quasi-free states, which means uh, the, uh, the, they are completely characterized by the one particle reduced density, which is defined by taking the projection onto this later determinant and then tracing out n minus one particles. So you see here I'm tracing out particles two to, to n. The result is an operator on the one particle space L2 of lambda, which after multiplication with n, I call omega. And if you do this simple computation, you will find out that omega is nothing but the orthogonal projection onto the n dimensional space spanned by this n orbitals F1 to Fn, okay? So uh, in particular, the energy of a Slater determinant can be expressed as a function of omega, right? Because, because as I said, it, it is quasi-free. It means every higher order correlation function, every higher order reduced density can be written in terms of the one particles by using the, the weak theorem. Okay, so this is what you get if you compute the energy of the Slater determinant. The result is called the Hartree-Fock energy functional. So the first term is just the kinetic energy, which is the trace of minus Laplacian, or more precisely minus epsilon squared times the Laplacian times omega. And then there are contributions due to the potential energy, and there are two contributions due to the potential energy. The first one, proportional to omega xx, omega yy, is the direct term, right? Omega xx is the density of particles close to point x, omega yy, is the density of particles close to point Y, right? So this is uh, what you would get if particle were independently distributed. And then there is a correction, which is called the exchange term, which is produced by the, by the, by the anti-symmetry of the, of the states, and is proportional to omega of X, Y squared. Good, so this is what you get if you compute the energy of a zeta determinant. Now, if you minimize overall possible zeta determinants, or equivalently, if you minimize overall omega between zero and one with trace equal to n, the Hartree-Fock energy associated with the reduced density omega, we call this guy here the Hartree-Fock energy, right? By construction, the real ground state energy, which I think I called En, is going to be smaller than En Hartree-Fock, right? Because En Hartree-Fock is the energy of the later determinants. And so we restrict the, the space of possible trial functions when we compute this one with respect to the, to the real ground state energy. Okay, so let me, uh, 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 let me first consider the Hartree-Fock ground state energy, and then we will see the relation with the real ground state energy. So what can we say about the Hartree-Fock energy HN? HF, so EN HF. Well, there is a case where it is very simple to compute the Hartree-Fock ground state energy, namely the case of free particles, right? If you assume the interaction to vanish, so we take V to be zero, then it's very easy to construct the minimizer of the Hartree-Fock energy. In this case, it's the same as the minimizer of the many body energy. So how do you do it? Well, you take the eigenstate of the Laplace operator, which are just the plane waves, and when you take one plane wave for each momentum p, you cannot put two, plane, two particles on the same state because, because of the, of the, of the anti-symmetry. You want to impose this, this uh, Pauli principle. So you start with the smallest possible p, which is p equal to zero, and then you have to uh, occupy state with a little bit larger p. And at the end, you will occupy all states, all plane waves, with momentum smaller than some uh, Fermi momentum. 
Okay, so if you want to do a picture in momentum space, you should think of this is P, P space. So then we have P equal to zero, right? We are on the torus, so momenta are discrete. Actually, momenta are uh, in Z free, right? Because we choose, a, we, choose, we choose on purpose the torus to have a, a length side, uh, two pi. So that here we, the momenta are, L, uh, are chosen in Z free. Okay, so this is my Z free. Well, it doesn't look like the dimensions, but something like that. And then on this uh, P space, we have to choose a radius, this Fermi radius PF, and a ball like that. And we have to choose PF so that the number of points in Z3 inside this uh, sphere, inside this ball, is N, right? Because we, add, we, we need N orbitals to accommodate for our N particles. Good. So, uh, well, of course, since we are in three dimension, uh, uh, it is clear that the uh, Fermi momentum is going to be of the order n to the one third. So it's very large, right? Because you need n points and therefore you need a volume proportional to n. Very well. Uh, um, so in this discussion, you see, I assumed already when I wrote this formula here, I assumed that the uh, Fermi ball is completely filled, right? So, uh, 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 of course, depending on N, it is possible that you are in a situation where some points on the ball are occupied and some points are, are empty, right? So I'm excluding this case here. How do you do it? Well, instead of thinking of N as the independent variable, you think of PF as the independent variable. At the end, we will let PF go to infinity. And then you fix N as a function of PF, measuring the number of points inside the ball with radius PF. Okay. So, so from now on, let's assume that the uh, ball is completely filled. Good. Uh, uh, if a ball is completely filled, interesting, it turns out that even when V is different than zero, so even when the interaction is not zero, the ground state energy, the Hartree-Fock ground state, the, the, the Hartree-Fock energy, so which we called ENHF, uh, uh, is the energy of the Fermi C. Okay, so it means the Fermi C does not only minimize the free energy, it also minimizes in this case, so if the ball is completely filled, it also minimizes the interacting Hartree-Fock functional, the Hartree-Fock functional with the potential, right? Of course, now uh, uh, the Hartree-Fock energy of the Fermi C will contain the, the free part, right? This is the, the kinetic energy, which is also there if you have three particles, but then there are contributions from the direct term, this is the direct term, and this guy here are the correction due to the exchange term in the artifact energy function. Okay, now what I said, so the fact that the uh, Hartree-Fock uh, uh, functional is minimized by the Fermi C is true under the assumption that the ball is filled. If it is not filled, then it does not need to be true. But uh, nevertheless, it was recently proven by uh, uh, Gontier, Heinzel, and Levine that, uh, uh, that, that the difference between the Hartree-Fock energy and the energy of the Fermi C so, uh, is very small. It is sub-exponentially small in the number of particles. And so it's e to the minus n to some, some power smaller than one, OK? So which means uh, um, here, for simplicity, let's do the assumption that the ball is completely filled. But even if we didn't do this assumption, what I'm going to say is more or less correct up to the trivial modifications. Uh, okay. Sorry, Benjamin. Yes. So your your omega sub f in the last in the last equation is the same as in the first one. Yeah, that's correct. It is just the you, you just feel you should just take these plane waves and you 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 feel all the plane wave inside inside this uh, this Fermi ball. You are surprised that it is uh, still a minimizer or what? Right, exactly. So yeah, I yes, uh, we, we were also surprised, but <laughs> but it is but you, correct. Uh, um, uh, but you minimize only among the uh, projections. Yes. Uh, uh, well, which is the same as minimizing overall omega between zero and one. I mean, minimizing right. over, over Slater determinants. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not talking about the full energy. I'm talking only about Hartree-Fock energy here. I'm, right. talking, I'm going to talk about the full energy in a second, but, but so right. far it's only Hartree-Fock. Okay. 
Right. Benjamin, yes. Are there any condition for the interaction potential? Is it for any interaction? It is. Uh, or... It is repulsive in the sense that it is of positive type. So uh -huh. the Fourier transform uh -huh. is positive. This we use in mm -hmm. this. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, is it obvious? And it is of course of this mean field type. I mean, I'm talking mm -hmm. about this mean field uh -huh. models. So that's, that's mean field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, is is it uh, is it an easy fact or? or it is not so difficult. It's uh, it's in the appendix of uh, of our paper. It's uh, it's a. Uh, it's a, it's a computation, but it's not too difficult. <clears throat> okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, we, can, uh, we can move on. So as I said, so far I only talked about the Hartley Fock uh, uh, functional. Uh, uh, um, what we are really interested in are the correction to the Hartley Fock energy due to the many body interactions, right? And these are called Correlation energy. This is called the correlation energy of the system. So the correlation energy is defined here by taking the full many body ground state energy EN and we subtract the Hartree-Fock energy, which we know to be just the energy of the, the Hartree-Fock energy of the Fermi C omega F. Okay. So that's the quantity that we are going to investigate. That's the quantity we're interested in, the correlation, the correlation energy. Okay, so so maybe um, Right, I mean, the name correlation, of course, uh, uh, since we have this, uh, the Pauli, we have to impose the Pauli principle, right? You can think that uh, already a uh, slater determinant have some correlations, right, between the particles. These correlations are just imposed by the requirement, by, by, by the statistics, if you want. So what, what, what we're referring to when we talk about correlation energy is instead correlations due to many body interactions, and these are not present in the slater determinant, of course. Good. So this is the result that we can prove. So we assume that the interaction potential V has compact support in momentum space, right? And also that it is sufficiently small. So we take the one norm of this V hat, right? V hat is discrete, so it's the sum of the Fourier coefficient has to be sufficiently small of order one, but sufficiently small. Okay, under this assumption, we can show that the correlation energy is given to leading order by this formula here, right? You see it is, well, kappa zero is a constant in something like four over, I know it's three over four pi to the one third, that's kappa zero. Epsilon, remember, is n to the minus one third. And then we have to sum over all k, over all momenta k of uh, uh, modulus of k, and then this, uh, this uh, integral here. Okay, so this is the formula to leading order for the correlation energy. The uh, formula is correct up to uh, corrections which are of lower order. So they are of the order epsilon to the one plus a little bit, plus one over 16 in our case. Okay, so, so you see the correlation energy is of the order n to the minus one third. So it is very small if you think co compared to the full energy, right? This system, the, the, the Hertrifoca energy, so this part here of the energy is of order n. Okay, so the correlation energy is uh, many order lower than the, than the Hartree Fock energy. It is only of the order n to the minus one third. Good. Let me make a couple of other remarks about this correlation energy. Well, one remark which I didn't, I didn't write, but it, uh, I, 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 of course I, I, can, I can tell you, of course, we, we know it already, right? The correlation energy must be negative because, because the Hartree Fock. Uh, the, the true ground state energy is certainly smaller than the Fock energy. So when you take this difference here, you get something which is negative. And indeed, if you compute this integral, you will find a negative value. Good. Now, uh, uh, let's come to this remark one. Now, if you look at this formula, you could take uh, uh, this log and you could expand it, right? You could expand this formula in powers of a potential. The linear contribution we had from this log cancels exactly with this term here. So the leading order contribution is going to be quadratic in the potential. And you can compute the quadratic order and you find it is given by this constant here times the sum over k and time v hat k squared, okay? This result, namely that to second order perturbation theory, you get this formula here up to correction that are small if you let v go to zero and then epsilon go to zero was already established by, with a rigorous version of uh, uh, second order perturbation theory in a paper, in a recent paper by Christian Heinzel, Marcello Porter, and Felix Rex 
Okay, so and we recover the same uh, the same uh, second order perturbation theory prediction. Unfortunately, because otherwise there was something wrong, it was a different uh, problem. Good. The second remark is that our, is that, that our result uh, confirms, if you want, the prediction of a formula from the physics literature, which was derived by German and Bruckner through, through the so-called uh, random phase approximation. Now, uh, German and Bruckner were interested in gelium, so in a system with Coulomb interaction. Our result does not apply to Coulomb interaction. But if you take this formula here and you replace V hat of K with the Coulomb in what you would get for the Coulomb interaction, you would find what German and Bruckner found. Okay, notice that for the Coulomb case, right, look at the formula in second order perturbation theory, right, for Coulomb potential, V hat of K is one over K squared, so this guy is one over K to the four times K is one over K cubed, which is not summable, right? So for, for the Coulomb potential, you get a logarithmic correction. The correlation energy is not a further epsilon, as we find, it is a further epsilon log of epsilon. Okay, we don't see it, of course, because we work with very smooth potential. We even assume that the Fourier transform is compact supported. Okay, so these are the uh, remarks about the result that we proved. Now, if there are no questions, then maybe I would uh, like to uh, explain some of the ideas behind the proof of uh, this uh, result. So uh, I'll go on. Well, if you want to estimate the correlation energy, namely the energy the correction of the energy with respect to the Hertz-Fock energy, it is convenient, it's very convenient to factor out, to remove, if you want, from the state that you're looking at, this later determinant, the Fermi C, right? You want to focus on the excitations of these later determinants. So how do you do it? Well, the first thing that you have to do is you have to represent your system on a Fox space, right? So we switch from this uh, representation of the n particle space to a representation of the Fox space on the fermionic Fox space, which is defined by taking the direct sum of the anti-symmetric subspace of L2 lambda to the small n in this case. And uh, on this Fox space, we consider the Hamilton operator, which I wrote down here. Well, you recognize again, this is the, the kinetic energy, of course, and you see we're still multiplying with epsilon square as I did in the, in the first slide of, uh, of this talk. And this is the uh, potential energy. It's a two particle interaction. So it's a quartic operator in the creations and annihilations operator A and A star. Since we're looking at fermions, this creations and annihilations operator satisfy canonical anti-commutation relations. So the anti-commutator of A, P and A, Q star is delta P, Q and all other anti-commutator are equal to zero, okay? If you take this guy here and you restrict it on the sector with exactly n particle, you find exactly the same Hamiltonian that we had in the previous slides. Okay, good. So this uh, is just a different, uh, uh, a different representation for the same system. Now we want to use the fact that we're in the Fox space to remove this uh, uh, Fermi C. And to do that, we introduce or we find a unitary operator R, a unitary map on the Fox space with the following two properties. First of all, R maps, so omega is just the vacuum on the Fox space, right? So uh, R maps the vacuum onto the Fermi C, right? The Fermi C you construct by adding to the vacuum a particle of momentum P for all P smaller or equal than the Fermi momentum. Okay, this is the first uh, point. The second point is that when we conjugate uh, the creations and annihilations operator. So here I'm doing for the creations operator, but you find you, you have the same formula also for the annihilations operator, of course. When you conjugate AP star, what do you get? Well, you still get the same AP star if your P is larger than the Fermi momentum. So if you are outside of the, of the slated determinant, outside of this Fermi C, and on the other hand, the creation operator turns into an annihilation operator if you are inside the Fermi C, okay? If P is smaller than the Fermi momentum, PF, right? If you think of, um, let me have a picture here again. So let's think of this momentum space as being our, our Fermi C, right? All states inside this, uh, this ball are occupied or states which are outside of it are, are, are empty, are free, right? 
So what are we doing here? Well, you see that after applying this, uh, after conjugating with R, uh, the operator AP star, so AP star, what, what it does when you, when you, when you apply it on, on, for P smaller than PF, well, you create a hole, right? So the AP star creates, after conjugation with R, the AP star creates an excitation of the Fermi C, which for P smaller than PF is just a hole in the Fermi C, right? If P is larger than PF out here, you still create particles, but if you are inside, you create holes. Okay, right, so using this R, we can switch to a new picture where the vacuum is the Fermi C and AP star create, not, do not create particles, they create excitation. And excitation can be either holes or holes in the Fermi C or uh, new particles outside of the Fermi C. Okay, so this is the idea behind this uh, operator, this, we call it particle hole transformation R. Good. Now to be precise, and maybe it's uh, um, useful to be a little bit more precise, uh, uh, right? At the end, we want to end up only on the n particle state, uh, l part, n particle space l to a of lambda to the n, right? So what, what it means is that actually we should not act with R on the full Fox space. We should only act on the subspace of the Fox space where this operator here takes the same value as this operator here. So the first operator measures the number of holes in the zeta determinant, and this guy measures the number of particles outside the zeta determinant, right? So how do you make sure that you have exactly n particle? Well, you, 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 you count how many, right? Because how do you create excitations if you don't want to create new particles? You have to move particles from the determinant out of the determinant, right? But this means that the number of holes that you have in the determinant must be the same of the number of particles that you have outside of the determinant. So this is how you can understand the fact that in fact, we should look at R restricted on this subspace here. That's the physically relevant subspace. It's the subspace where NP is equal to NH. Okay, good. So now if we have this uh, uh, operator R, right? We can define a new Hamilton operator, which I call the excitation Hamiltonian. Namely, we want to look at the Hamiltonian from the point of view of excitations, right? We want to, rem we, we remove through R, we remove this letter determinant, and we want to look at uh, excitations of this letter determinant, the energy of the excitation of this letter determinant. And we do so by defining this new operator LN, by conjugation of the H, okay? Good. Now, um, let's try to compute what this, uh, Ln is, right? So to do so, we have to conjugate the kinetic and the potential energy because Hn, if you remember, has a kinetic component and there's a potential component. Let's start by conjugating the kinetic energy, which is the simpler of the, of the two energy to conjugate. There are less terms, of course. So how do we do it? Well, well, we, you remember how this Rx e, uh, maps creations operator into creations operator if P is outside the Fermi C, and it, it, it inverts creation simulation operator if you are inside the Fermi C, right? So, so here to compute the action of R, I have to distinguish two cases. The first case is when P is smaller than the Fermi momentum. The second case is when P is bigger than, larger than the Fermi momentum, right? So if we are here, then we are outside the Fermi C, and it means AP star AP remains invariant. We still have AP star AP. On the other hand, when you are here in this data determinant, then we have to invert them, right? Because of the formula that we have over here, right? This guy here. If you are inside the momentum, a creation operator becomes an annihilation operator and vice versa. Good, so we do it. The AP star AP here becomes AP AP star, right? So now I want to put them back as a, in normal order, so that's A star AP. And how do I do it? Well, I use the anti-commutation relations, right? AP, AP star is the same as minus AP star AP. That's why you get the minus here. And then there is a price to be paid, which is the anti-commutator. The anti-commutator is, is, is equal to one. So you get this factor here, okay? Now, if you look for a second, this factor here is nothing but the kinetic energy of the Fermi C, right? And then you can combine what is left, namely this one and this one into a single operator H0, where the dispersion 
is measured with respect to the Fermi energy, right? Pf is the radius of this Fermi sphere, epsilon squared Pf squared is the energy of a mode with momentum exactly Pf, okay? Now you see, uh, uh, how do you get from these two things into this single one? It is, it is just because uh, the contribution of epsilon squared Pf squared, right? right I'm using the fact that the number of holes is equal to the number of particles, right? Because we, the physically relevant states, we have this equality between number of holes and number of particles, which means that for free, I can add here a minus epsilon square PF squared, and I can add here a minus epsilon square PF squared. And if you do so, you get exactly this formula here. This is the kinetic energy of my excitations of the Fermi C. Right, so the total kinetic energy is the kinetic energy of the Fermi C plus the kinetic energy of the excitations. Okay, so now we should do the same thing also for the potential energy. See com what comes out from the potential energy operator, right? Before doing that, let me just use this formula here for the kinetic energy to get some more information about the states that we want to look at. So the point is that when you conjugate the potential energy, you get a bunch of terms and you want to know a priori which one of these terms is important and which one is that already negligible, okay? And to, to have an idea of this, uh, let's try to get some a priori control for state which are close to the, to, the, to the ground state we're interested in. Okay, so here I'm using the fact that V is of positive type. You see, this inequality you probably saw uh, uh, several times. Because since V is of positive type, we can integrate V of X minus Y times a function of X and the, or measure depending on X and the measure depending on Y, the result must be positive or bigger or equal than zero at least. And now if you work out what this sum is, well, you get the uh, sum of, the, uh, of, of all these off diagonal terms, so V X I minus X J, you have some terms on the diagonal, it's this one, and then you have, uh, uh, n squared times the integral of v is the Fourier transform of zero. Okay, so now I change a bit the. So you get this formula here. This formula here allows us, if you divide by one over two n, I guess. So you, what what you find here is exactly the many-body interaction energy, and it gives us a lower bound for the many-body interaction energy, and therefore a lower bound for the full Hamilton operator. Right. So the Hamilton operator is bigger than the kinetic energy. And then this two contribution, which comes out of this one and this one. Okay, good. Now we conjugate with R, right? We remove the Fermi C and we focus on its excitation. If we conjugate with R here, we get the new excitation Hamiltonian, okay? If you conjugate with R the kinetic energy, we just did this computation, we get the kinetic energy of the slater determinant of the Fermi C, sorry, plus this operator H0, which is the kinetic energy of the excitations, right? And now what you notice is that if you combine the kinetic energy of the Fermi C here with these two terms coming from this estimate over there, right? Well, you get exactly, well, up to an error of order epsilon, you get the Artifoc energy of the Fermi C. Okay, right, you recognize immediately this is the direct term. Well, maybe the, the, the exchange term is a little bit more difficult to look at, but well, uh, believe me, we, 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 we can even go back and uh, check about ourselves. <clears throat> so this is the, this is the, 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 the energy, the, the artifact energy of the Fermi, of the Fermi C, right? And this is the kinetic energy, fine. This is the direct term, which we just saw in the other, fine, in the other slide. And, and this is the, this is the exchange term, right? Now you see in the exchange term, uh, the P and P prime are restricted inside the Fermi ball. Now, if you remove one of this restriction, then you get exactly V of zero, right? The sum of V hat of P over all P is V of zero. And then the sum of the other P is going to cancel this factor of N. So in first approximation, this is exactly equal to V of zero over two. There are corrections to that and the corrections are order epsilon, but you can easily see, okay? so. So this was just to motivate the fact that what I have here, the combination of these three terms up to error of order epsilon is just the Artifoc energy of the Fermi C. 
Okay, so why do I like this formula? Well, because, because you see on state which are interesting for us, on state which should use for approximation for the ground state, right? We can assume that L, right, is smaller than Vertrifoc energy, right? Actually, Vertrifoc energy is the expectation of, of L in the vacuum, right? So the real ground state, in the real ground state, L is certainly smaller than that. But if you know that this is smaller than this one, we immediately see that on physically relevant states and physical on approximations of the ground state, the, the operator H0 is bounded by a constant times epsilon. So you get a priori control on the kinetic energy of excitations in any approximate ground state vector. Okay. Now, from the bound on the kinetic energy, you can also get with some more work, non trivial work approximations or bounds on the number of excitations in states which are approximation for the for the ground state vector. okay so 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 from now on and, and as i said I, I told you right i want to use this a priori bound so that when i look at what happens when i conjugate the, the, the potential energy i will get several terms but many of them i can already know at the beginning that they're small right they're small because we have this a priori control on h on the kinetic energy of excitations and on the number of excitations. Okay. So let's now go back to the, to the potential energy and let's try to see what happens if we conjugate the potential energy with this uh, unitary map R, right? Now, uh, I told you there are several terms, right? Why, why are there so many terms? Well, because we have to distinguish every time so whether P plus R or Q or Q plus R or P, this momenta, whether they are above PF, so they are outside the Fermi C, or whether they are inside the Fermi C. If they are inside, if they are outside, nothing, they remain invariant. If they are inside, the creation operator turns in an addition operator and vice versa. Okay. So you see that you get several contributions. Here, I wrote down two of these contributions to illustrate what, what can happen. So this is a contribution where all the momenta involved in this potential energy are bigger than, than the Fermi momentum, right? So all of them are outside of the Fermi C, if you want. In this case, the operator remains invariant. So I, the action of R doesn't change anything. Good, if you have this kind of situation here, then it is easy. So with P1 should be Q1, actually. It is easy to estimate the uh, um, expectation of this operator just by Cauchy Schwarz, right? Because she Schwarz, you take two of these guys, you put it on, on one of xi, the other two you put on the other xi, and then you, uh, uh, you, 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 you do Cauchy Schwarz for the sum, and you see when within each one of these parentheses, we have three indices, right? The R, the P, and the Q here, the R, the Q, and the P here, so we can do these sums. The results are proportional to the action of the number of particles operator on xi, we have it twice, so it's squared. And then times one over n. The one over n is from the fact that we are in this mean field situation. So the potential is multiplied with one over n oxide. Okay. So you see that on state with few excitations, if we have some control on this term here, this guy is small. Right. So maybe I should, I should remember the, 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 the energy we want to identify, this correlation energy, is of the order epsilon, which is n to the minus one third. Right. So if this is one over n, this looks at least smaller than n to the minus one third. Therefore, we can assume these terms here is an error. It's not going to contribute to this correlation energy, which can, we can neglect this term here. Okay, so these are, uh, this is an example of one of the terms which come out of the potential energy here. You can forget about, you can put in the error. Okay. So now the second example I want to look at is a term that you cannot forget, you cannot neglect. Okay. So this is what happens if two of the momenta, so here P plus R and Q, for example, they are uh, outside the Fermi C, so they're bigger than PF, and the other two momenta are smaller than PF, so they, they act inside the Fermi C. They create, they create holes in that sense, okay? Right, so if, if these two momenta are smaller than PF, when you act with this map R, you should, you should uh, turn, you should uh, transform the two annihilation operator into additional creation operator. So this guy here has four creation operators, right? So if you, if you try to argue as we did in the previous slide for this term here with Cauchy-Schwarz, then you're going to run into trouble, 
Why? Well, because on one side, you will have four operators here. On the other side, you will have no operators. And then it's difficult to sum over P over, over the two momenta, right? How do you do the sum? Well, to do these sums, you have to use the fact that P and QR are bounded by PF. And, and, and this is going to give something. But of course, PF is n to the one third. So the two sum are going to produce a factor of n, which is going to cancel this n here. So it's impossible to prove that these terms are, at least, well, it is impossible because I know that, it's, that these terms contribute. But this, this, you cannot prove that these terms here are negligible, right? Even on, on states with few excitations on approximation for the, for the ground state vectors, uh, uh, there is no reason to believe that the contribution of this guy here is negligible. So we have to keep this contribution. Now, while this contribution is not negligible, it has a nice structure and we want to use this nice structure. Let me try to explain which one is, the, which structure I'm talking about. You see, so these are terms. At the end, there are uh, three terms like, uh, like, like this one, so which are not negligible uh, in, the, in, in the limit. Uh, uh, these are terms where you always have two uh, momenta associated with uh, particles outside the Fermi C and two momenta associated with holes inside the Fermi C. We have two holes and two, and two particles, okay? which means that these terms can be written as quadratic expressions in this new operator, which I call B star, and then we also see the corresponding relations operator B, where B is defined by this formula here. You see, I'm taking here two A star operator. One, so let's see, the P is below PF. So the, the, the A P star creates a hole. This other guy creates a particle, right? So we create, a pair consisting of a particle and a hole using this operator dr. Okay, good. And you see, and then it's a very easy computation in this case here, you can write this term here as quadratic expression in this b star r and then b star of minus r. Okay, so why do we like that? Well, because this uh, particle all pairs operator, uh, simple computation shows that behave approximately like bosonic operator, right? Remember the A are fermionic operator, they, they satisfy anti-commutation relations, right? The B instead, they satisfy commutation relation. Well, this one uh, is really uh, uh, easy to see that uh, they commute, of course. So if, if you take two B star or two B, they're going to commute, that's fine. Uh, uh, um, just because they consist of two anti-commuting uh, operators in this, uh, in this case. Uh, uh, what is a little bit less trivial is to check that when you commute a B and a B star up to some normalization constant that later we will have to worry about, well, uh, uh, you get uh, uh, the bosonic result, namely delta of R and Q, so one if R is equal to K and zero otherwise, up, of course, to corrections. The corrections are small on states with few excitations, okay? So you see the, the strategy then is going to be like that. I want to use this a priori control that I have on the number of, uh, on, on the energy and the number of uh, uh, excitations of the Fermi C in order then to argue that this B operator behaves essentially like bosonic operator in order to consider this contribution to the potential as a quadratic bosonic operator because I like bosonic operators which are quadratic in creation of relations operator simply because I, like, I, I know how to compute their energy. I know how to, di to diagonalize that, okay? So that's the, that's the philosophy here. Good, um, uh, fine. So now let's sum up what we uh, said so far. Well, uh, if you believe to everything that I said, uh, you, you will agree with me that the, uh, the um, excitation Hamiltonian L, well, you get the full, uh, um, R3 Fock energy of the Fermi C. I only show this for the, for the kinetic energy, right? But of course, from the potential energy, when you conjugate all these terms, in particular, you get out of it the potential energy of the Fermi C, which is a constant, right? Well, you, you must get something like that because the vacuum expectation of this guy here should be exactly the, this number here. Okay, so you get this number here. Then from the from the kinetic energy, you get this uh, 
operator H0, the kinetic energy of the excitation. From the potential energy, you get uh, uh, three contributions. So, so in the previous slide, we focused on this one. There are, no, sorry, we focused on this one, I think. There are two more, where one is just the, con the, con the, the emission conjugate, the BB contribution. And then there is also a B star B uh, contribution, which you cannot neglect, but, but, but can also be written as a quadratic expression in this new B and B star operators. Okay, and then there are corrections, but the corrections are small on states with few excitations. Okay, and because of the argument I gave you previously, we can restrict our attention to state with few excitations. Okay, so we 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 have to worry of this thing here, right? Because you remember the correlation energy is the correction with respect to this guy here. So we want to subtract this guy here. So the correlation energy is the ground state energy order, is the ground state energy of these two guys here. Okay, so I told you I'm, I, was, I was happy about the potential energy because I was able to write the potential energy as quadratic expression in this BN, approximately bosonic B and B star operator. What can we do about the H0 operator? Can we write also H0 in terms of these B and B star operators? Well, let's try. Let's try to look what is the kinetic energy of a mode that you create by applying a B star operator on the vacuum. Okay. Well, I just I just plug in the definition of B B star, right? You have to sum over Q in the Fermi sphere so that Q plus R is outside the Fermi sphere and you apply H0 on this state here, okay? Now, since Q plus R is outside the Fermi sphere and this is inside, when you apply, when you remember the dispersion uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this operator H0, and if you don't remember, it's written here. Well, we get once epsilon squared times Q plus R squared. This is the energy of the particle outside the Fermi sphere. And then we have to subtract the energy of the hole that we create with the second operator, which is epsilon Q squared, epsilon squared Q squared. Okay, fine. So we get this difference here. Now, uh, right, uh, you should think that the R is, an is, is, is a momentum of order one, okay? Because the R is always coupled with the, with the V, so the V is compact to support, so the, the R is of order one. The Q here is large, right? Because Q is close to the Fermi sphere. The Fermi sphere is radius n to the one first, so the Q is large. So when you look at this difference here, well, you are happy that the Q square cancel, but then the first correction is linear in Q, right? It's Q times R times two. This is what you get, okay? And when you see that because this depends on Q, I'm summing over Q, I cannot take it out of the sum, so I cannot reconstruct B star R omega with some dispersion epsilon of R. Okay, so so this is to say uh, 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 this suggests and this, or shows that H zero cannot be written uh, simply in terms as a quadratic expression in terms of this B and B star operator. Okay, it suggests that, but it also shows how to solve this problem, right? Because in order to be able to write H zero in terms of this B operator. What we would like to do, we would like to take the Q outside of the sum, right? So how should we do it? Well, we should localize in momentum space these modes, right? And this we do using these patches. So we take the Fermi sphere, which is here uh, green, and we divide it into M patches. So at the end, M is some small power of N, okay? We call the patches B alpha and alpha goes from one. To n and associated with every patch, we define a new uh, operator B star k of alpha, which is defined exactly like the B star k of before, with the only difference that now we only take P inside the patch B alpha. Okay, we do it separately on each patch, and then we also we also normalize it. So we divide by this n alpha of k, and alpha of k is the number of pairs particles or pairs that you can find in the patch alpha, for example, if you take this patch here. Okay, good. So now we do the same argument as before. We look at the kinetic energy of a mode of an excitation that you create by applying B star on the vacuum, sorry, B star alpha on the vacuum. And now you find the same computation like before, 
The difference is that now, since we restrict Q inside the patch B alpha, where we can approximate Q by this vector W alpha, which is the center of the patch alpha. Okay, and if you can approximate Q by W alpha, you can take it out of the or, or take it out of the sum, and you reconstruct the sum defining B star R alpha. Okay, so you see that with this trick here now we can at least this argument here suggests that H zero can be written as a quadratic operator in this localized uh, modes B R alpha and B R alpha star. Okay, and that this is the corresponding dispersion now. Very well. So now summarizing again, so we, we write it towards, we're moving towards the conclusion. Uh, uh, we can write the excitation Hamiltonian as, well, this is where the focal energy of the Fermi C, which is, uh, we already had it before. Now we combine what comes from the kinetic energy H0 and what comes from this QB operator, right? The QB was already quadratic in these B operators, but the B of course are linear combination of B of these localized uh, operators B alpha star and B alpha uh, without star. So again, uh, the contribution from this QB uh, part is going to be quadratic in this new localized uh, modes. Uh, and we obtain this formula here. So you see that we, are, we have a sum over K and then for, for each fixed K, we have an operator HK, which is quadratic in B and B star. Now with the modes indices alpha and beta, right? So we have here, and this is the off diagonal part. And then we have some appropriate kernels here. I even wrote it down here. It's not, uh, it's not so important. You have to combine modes corresponding to k with modes corresponding to minus k. Uh, that's why it looks a little bit different from the previous slides. But uh, but uh, the important thing is that we have we write this Hamiltonian as a quadratic uh, um, expression in operators, namely b star alpha b b b b, b alpha that are uh, that satisfy uh, approximately bosonic uh, commutation relations. And once you have this expression here, then you know how to but diagonalize it, right? Because this is Bogolyubov theory, bosonic Bogolyubov theory. So we define a, a, a Bogolyubov transformation or what would be a Bogolyubov transformation if this operator B and B star would satisfy, would really satisfy bosonic commutation relations, right? We take the exponential of B star, B star minus BB expression with an appropriate kernel K, right? And then we show that the action of this T on this operator B is almost right. If it was a bosonic transformation, this would be exactly the formula that you would get, right? The usual cosh and the cinch, right? Now the Bs are not satisfying exactly bosonic uh, commutation relations. So there are corrections, which I indicate here with the fact that here it's uh, not exactly equal, but we can prove that the corrections are small on state with few excitation. Why can we prove it? Because because the commutation relation are almost bosonic and the correction are small exactly on state with few excitations, right? So if you have few excitations, if you know a priori that you have few excitations or that the energy of excitation is small, then we can approximate the action of a T by the action of a normal bosonic Bogolyubov transformation. Okay. And if you have this formula here, then you know how to choose K in order to diagonalize this quadratic operator here. I wrote down well, the choice is, uh, is, is written here. Uh, it's maybe it's not, so, it's not so important. I think that you can believe that once you have a quadratic operator and you can think of it as being quadratic in bosonic operators, then you know how to do the diagonal. Okay, so you do it. And this is the final result. So we find the earth focal energy of a, Fermi, of a Fermi C. And then this is the correction to the energy uh, uh, from these um, bosonic uh, uh, excitations. And, uh, and, uh, and, and at the same time, you also get uh, a positive uh, uh, quadratic expression in B and B star. Okay. So at the end, what you have to do, you have to compute uh, this uh, 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 trace here. You can do it and you will find that to leading order, it is exactly this integral that we have in our, in our theorem. So this concludes the proof of the theorem that I uh, mentioned before. Now, uh, since I still have five minutes, is it, is it right? Yeah. Um, okay. 
we started a bit late, so yeah. Okay, so um, I, I will not need more than five minutes. Uh, um, uh, there are a couple of facts that I that I uh, 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 that I didn't tell you during during the talks in order to make the talks simple. Uh, uh, well, um, maybe I can mention it now at least a couple of them. So, so the, the first thing that I um, didn't tell you, right? I, uh, this patch decomposition, right? Of course, you can define these modes, but you have to make sure that there are, right? You want to make sure that on each patch there are enough enough of these particle old pairs in order to 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 look at the collective behavior of this of this uh, of these modes. Uh, um, um, there are patches, however, where this is not the case, right? Because you remember that. Uh, in, in order to have a particle all pairs, you need P to be inside PF and P plus K to be outside, right? Now, if you, let me, I can do a, so this is our, our Fermi board, right? Now, suppose that K is like that, right? So the second, or this is minus K maybe. So the second Fermi board is, uh, is shifted a bit. Well, and I cannot draw very nicely, unfortunately. Like that. So at, at the end, the, the P which, uh, for, for which you can satisfy these two conditions are contained in a small, uh, so I call it a, so a half moon, or uh, I don't know how to call it, something, something like that, right? And you see if K goes in this direction, if you are very close to the equator, then there are going to be very few modes. So one of the fact, one of the challenges that we have to face is that we have to exclude some patches close to the, Close to the equator. Okay, so this compli complicates a little bit uh, the analysis, but uh, um, we can still uh, we can still do it. Uh, another challenge that I didn't mention, right? I, I told you that uh, once you define this localized uh, creation simulations operator, uh, um, H zero on that is is is, is approximately giving by this uh, um, dispersion relation here, and then you get back the same set B star, right? And then I told you, and this is unfortunately not true, but this implies that H0 can be approximated by a diagonal operator in V and B star, okay? So this is not true. The fact that H0 on V states gives something like that does not imply in general that you can write H0 like that. The only thing that this implies, this uh, uh, approximation here, is that uh, the difference between the real operator H0 and this bosonic approximation for it, so which I call DB, the different approximately commute with all B and B star operators. So this is what you get, which translates into saying that when you conjugate the difference H0 minus DB with this Bourgogneau transformation, well, it remains essentially invariant, right? Because, well, how do you compute the action of a T? Well, you can take the derivative, uh, uh, right, you see that, Every commutator is essentially zero, so so the only contribution to this is, is essentially this quantity. Okay, so so this is what you have, and then you have to use this observation here to argue as I did before, and this of course makes the analysis also a little bit more difficult because it means that in the final expression, right, I also have an additional mistake, which is this thing here, right, because what I have is the H zero, and what I want to have is the dB. Right, because the DB I can write in terms of quadratic B and B star operators, right? Okay, but I, I can do it. I can add the DB and, and take it out, but then I have this, this additional mistake here. And the nice thing about this additional mistake is that when you do the Bogolubo transformation to diagonalize the bosonic part, it does not change. It stays like that, right? Because that's what I told you before. Because indeed, the fact that H0 has, right? This observation here implies that the conjugation remains uh, invariant. Okay, so this is the nice, the nice thing. It's still like that, but at the end, you see, we have to bound this uh, minus dB operator. I mean, H zero. Well, of course, now I'm, I'm thinking about if you want to prove the energy, you have to prove an upper bound and the lower bound, right? So the, the, the upper bound, you put it on the vacuum. On the vacuum, this is zero, so it doesn't matter. So the problem is for the lower bound. And if you look at the lower bound, well, H0 is positive, so you don't care, but you have to worry about this minus dB factor. And what we do, we use this uh, excitation energy here, this contribution which comes out from the diagonalization of the bosonic operator to control the minus dB operator. And this is a point where we, we, we use the smallness of the potential. Uh, good. And the last thing that I, a little bit when I uh, 
uh, explain to you is this uh, is this a priori control right i told you that we have this bound here for h0 and this is completely true and it's, uh, it's 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 correct what is not completely correct is that right this operator here has a very small gap because of this epsilon square epsilon square is n to the minus two thirds right so so it means the bound for the kinetic energy of excitation only give us a rough bound on the number of excitation this m plus right from n to epsilon is n to the minus one third but we only we can only prove that m plus is n to the plus one third okay and since it only it is only n to the plus one third so in order to uh, neglect all these terms arising from the potential energy with q1 like terms right uh, you remember i told you that q1 was bounded by n squared divided by n right but now if n plus counts as n to the plus one third, n squared is n to the two third divided by n is n to the minus one third, and n to the minus one third is exactly the order of the of the correlation energy. So, so this is not good enough. So we have to do something better. We have to we have to compare. We have to bound this Q1 operator in terms of the of the kinetic energy, and we have to do it with a small factors in front, and that's also. Another place where we use the smallness of the potential that I mentioned in the paper. Okay, so um, I think that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Benjamin, for this really interesting talk. Um, are there any questions? You can just unmute yourself and speak up. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, assume you look at the low energy states rather than the ground state, and you want to understand uh, how how this uh, cor correlation depends on the density functional, so density density matrix. Uh, yes, and I'm not sure what I understand. I mean, of course, you can. But this is a perfectly uh, uh, correct question. You can also ask about. Uh, um, excitations if you look at the formula that we have now let's look at the simplified version so this version here right this is the this is the Fock energy this is to leading order this correlation energy for the ground state and then there is this guy here which is supposed to describe if you want uh, uh, excitations now this uh, operator here describes excitations uh, of this bosonic type uh, it is difficult for us to exclude the existence of excitation of different type, right? And, and you, you can think of it, I mean, uh, um, that's also why, uh, you remember, I, I told you before, right? If, if, if you do it correctly, you also have this H minus dB, and then we use this guy here, we use the, the, the operator which should describe excitations to control this uh, negative contribution minus, uh, minus dB. So that's why, or that's one of the reasons why we cannot say much about uh, excitations. But but if you restrict yourself to excitation of this bosonic type, so you want to describe this excitation in terms of this uh, K tilde operator, then you can say a lot. And in fact, we also looked at the dynamics of this excitation. So if you prepare an initial data where you create excitations by these uh, creations operators here, then you can uh, evolve them. And on the correct time scale, you can prove that the evolution is completely described by this uh, operator here. This, this one, can, one can do. So these excitations, excitations are not in the ground state. Excitation with, res uh, uh, with respect to hartree fox state of the full state. That's correct. Yes. So you can you can look at you can look at the low energy states. Right. Well, not at the no, no, not at the level of the, of the spectrum. I cannot tell you the spectrum of this guy is ground state, and then I can tell you what are the excited eigenvalues. This I cannot do because I cannot exclude that there are other excitations. But what I can do, I can look at the dynamics of X, or what we can do with, with Marcello, with Niels, with Nam, and with Robert. Uh, we, we we look at the dynamics of this. Uh, of this uh, excitation. So you create a time zero excitation supplying this B star operator, and then you follow their evolution and you prove that the evolution can be this the many body evolution can be described by the Bogolyubov Hamiltonian given by this K tilde here essentially. Well, of course, you have to subtract all this constant here, but the, for the evolution, they're not interesting. For the evolution, the non trivial part of evolution is this K tilde operator here. So this we can do. But I cannot, I cannot describe the spectrum above the ground state. But 
I'm more interested in the understanding whether there's correction to the heart refog uh, functional. So you look, we look at the omega density matrices which are close to the ground state, right? And then I would like to to have a better approximation to the to the full Hamiltonian by adding a correlation term like it's done in density functional theory, adding correlation correlation ter term to the Hartree-Fock functional as a, as a functional of omega. So what I, what I think this means is that you have to describe the excitation in terms of this Bogol bosonic Bogolubov theory. Now, uh, uh, it's, very, it's very similar to what we have for bosons, right? If you look at, uh, at Hartree theory in, uh, in bosons, right? If you have bosons and condensation, then uh, you can describe it in first approximation by, by, by Hartree theory, right? You take the minimizer of the Hartree, of the Hartree function. Now, uh, excitations of this uh, or corrections to this Hartree theory can be described by Bogolubov theory in a sense, right? I, I don't know how to change the one particle reduced density with a different theory, but I know on the many body level, it can be described in terms of this quadratic Hamiltonian, which is a Bogolubov Hamiltonian. So that's, that's the okay. point of view that I think applies here, like it applies for the, for the bosons, I mean, for the gross pitayevsky limit or in the Hartree Fock or in the Hartree limit. Okay, okay, so, and the second question is, can I think about going from creation operators A and A star to the B and B star as a kind of, some kind of a mean field theory for the excitations? Um, no, I think, I think it's, uh, I mean, going from the A to the B is really, you have to, you, you double them, right? you take two fermions and that's why at the end it behaves like a boson. So uh, I don't see it right. as a, I don't see how okay, to- Okay, so for pairs, so mean field theory for pairs. Uh -huh. um... or, or for any excitations which leading term is, gives you, uh, is given by, by mean field theory of pairs. Correct. It's possible, yes. Um, um, so you're thinking of kind of BCS functions or something like that. I mean, uh, uh, I'm not. Uh, we we haven't thought of it in these terms, but but maybe maybe it's a possibility. Yes. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Michael. I couldn't answer very very well. To <laughs> No, no, it's <laughs> so, so to, to, to give give a chance to other people to uh, insert a question. Is there anybody else? I think I saw a hand before. Yes. Oh, yes. How? Yeah. So before talking about excitation, so I, I want to understand what do you know or what do you believe about the ground state, the true ground state? So um, is it some, so it's a kind of, so you start from hot ray fog ground state yes. and you sort of dress it a little bit by this particle hole pair? Is That's that correct, so yes. You, you uh -huh. dress it with this transformation T, mm. the Bogolubo transformation. Mm. So, 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 uh, uh, now, so you don't have anything, yeah. You don't have anything drastic like superconductivity. You just dress it a little bit. That's uh -huh. right, yes. And you believe that you, uh, you have correct description of the ground state or? Um, oh, yes, I think I think mm. it is uh, uh -huh. correct. I mean, the limits. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. right. If if you think backwards to what I did first, I applied this operator R to remove yeah. to remove mm -hmm. the Fermi mm -hmm. and then I applied mm -hmm. this operator T mm -hmm. to diagonalize the bosonic part. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Okay. And mm -hmm. at, at that level, the, the vacuum afterwards is a good approximation. So mm -hmm. if you go backwards, you should think that R times T times omega, omega being the vacuum, is a good approximation for the ground mm -hmm. state uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the ground mm -hmm. state vector. Uh, okay. On the yeah. Level. But okay. we don't have uh, uh, rigorous statements about this, and mm -hmm. I think that uh, right. I mean, the, the problem is that um, um, excitations. I mean. The gap in this Hamiltonian is very small, right? Mm -hmm. The energy difference is very small. So it is uh, possible to measure uh, energies quite precisely, but it is difficult to make statements about approximation of ground state vectors. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> 
thank so you in the meantime, I, uh, um, uh, oh, you have, you I have, wanted you to remind you about <laughs> this, uh, um, <laughs> about the ICMP. So maybe let me give a short update about the ICMP. So the, the conference is going to take place. So we are very optimistic now that it can take place uh, uh, with a large on-site component so that we will be able to welcome many um, uh, participants uh, in Geneva. For people who still cannot uh, come to Geneva, the full conference will be also streamed online. So we have this hybrid uh, format, format. If you haven't registered yet, I invite you to register. Uh, if you can come to Geneva, of course, for the on-site uh, participation. If you really cannot come to Geneva, then at least for the online uh, participation to the conference. And, yeah. thank, thank you, Benjamin, for, for this commercial break. So <laughs> it, it, would be, it would be great to see as many as uh, possible of you guys to, uh, in Geneva on ICMP. I definitely plan on coming. Um, if, if they let me out of the UK. <laughs> uh, okay, are there any more questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, so th there is, there is an, uh, an, a different approach to fermionic systems where you uh, minimize over uh, um, fermionic uh, uh, fer uh, quasi-free states. Uh, so not just uh, over Slater determinants, but mm -hmm. also uh, about states which which uh, which have pairing. I mean the. Uh, now, yes. Uh, I mean it's relevant it's, also at zero temperature or. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm talking about zero temperature. Mm -hmm. I mean you, you uh, Slater determinants are not the only quasi-free. Uh, That's group. correct. Pure quasi-free fermionic states. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, could uh, I mean this? This is a completely different philosophy, and uh, I wonder whether whether you can compare these two philosophies. Uh, uh, My feeling is that the effect of the, of, of, of the alpha of the pairing would be very small in this kind of mean field uh, mean field uh, limit. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think that I heard from physicists that there are some situations where, where this uh, bosonized uh, approach that you used ap applies, and uh, there are some other situations where the purely fermionic. Uh, I, see. I mean, th th this is my vague recollection, but. Uh, uh, um, I. Uh... I think I cannot comment on, on that. I don't know if somebody else wants to comment. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I actually think that that Bogolyubov, I mean, uh, a long time ago, proposed this uh, purely fermionic uh, approach. So, but purely fermionic, what do you mean? You mean so? so you... I mean, uh, so just uh, minimizing all, over quasi-free, uh, pure, pure quasi, or maybe not. I mean. Quasi but, 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 but why you should get something better than R3 Fock? So what you want to do, if I understand correctly, is you want to replace this uh, uh, bosonic excitation or what you get from this bosonic excitation by a more general fermionic states, uh, right? Yeah, but, I uh, well, well, you, you minimize over a much larger family of of states. Yeah. Uh, so, so in principle, you can get a better bound. I, so this is exactly mm -hmm. what yes, you're doing, right. superconductivity. Right. Um, this is not a superconductivity, so I don't. <coughs> so, uh, it's possible that in certain regime, this 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 will be useful. I mean, the, the our approximation is beyond quasi-free, right? The quasi-free is where three fog, and then we come with this. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Path. So it's, it's, if you want, it's, it's, it's quasi-free because. Uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, it is quadratic in the bosonic uh -huh. operator, but it is quartic in the fermionic operator. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, so, so your your approximation is beyond the Hartree Fock. Uh, I mean, Hartree Fock is ju just uh, minimizing over uh, Slater determinants. Yes. And and then you you do a uh, I mean, you you bosonize uh, 
yes. the, the quartic term and, and, and then it's and, quasi free in the bosonic sense yeah, right. yeah so so it is it is a completely different philosophy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, under under the assumptions of of your results it, it it seems to work better yeah but there is an alternative uh, philosophy i just wonder whether it it has any uh, okay um, I, uh, it's possible maybe in different regimes uh, uh, I'm not uh, familiar with it, so I would have to 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 to, to look it up. Thank you. Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, any more questions or comments? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. So I suggest we all thank Benjamin again for this very nice talk. Thank you.